everybody and welcome back to stevie's tech talk i have our first ever really famous guest today that's right i finally landed a big fish i've got jeff atwood here from stack overflow and now discourse jeff was the founder or co-founder of stack overflow and he has had an illustrious and remarkable career and we've all followed it for a long time of course as you know stack overflow is the most important resource for programmers around the world and uh, when Jeff started it, I actually didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> I don't think I ever told him that. Anyway, Jeff, we're really, really glad to have you on the show. We had a camera issue that we couldn't resolve, and so we're going to do audio only today. But still, very pleased to have Jeff on the show. So, Jeff, take it away. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, you know, incredible compliment to say that Stack Overflow is, is such an important resource. And I, I like to think of myself as a tool builder. And I think that's par partially because I'm, I'm overcompensating because I'm, I'm a terrible, terrible mentor. Like, I'm just not good at mentoring. Uh, but I'm really, really good at uh, execution and tool building. And I, I feel like Stack Overflow was this sort of Venn diagram of things that we needed. Um, and me and Joel Spolsky, I, I approached Joel. I approached a number of people online. And I might have actually emailed you. If I went back in my email history, it's possible I emailed you at the same in the same tranche of emails. You probably that I did. Sent. And I probably went, no, that's stupid. <laughs> because uh, I didn't I didn't get it. Right? Like I d I didn't think it would fly. Google had tried something like that and it, it didn't get off the ground. So I just completely misunderstood the scale that it was going to be able to operate at and how successful it would be. So mm -hmm, my loss. Yeah, it's entirely possible you were one of the people that I mailed. Because I remember having all this energy in my blog of all these people paying attention. This was back when people used to blog. Everybody who doesn't know the word, you can Google it. It's fallen so far out of favor. And Joel came back with this great idea, which was there's this site, Experts Exchange, with a very unfortunate URL. Once you combine those two words, you get kind of another word in the middle that you don't really want. Ah, uh, yes, that's one uh, of the famous URLs. Yes, uh, but the service it was providing was a good service, but pre prevent presented in the worst possible used car sales scammy way imaginable. Mm. Uh, it was a Q&A site for programmers and would come up all the time in your Google searches, but it was just like walking onto the lot of a really terrible used car salesman, right? Well, like the, the plaid suit, the horrible tie, the uh probably a new york accent just the worst imaginable experience and joel and i were like what if that but not sucking right like remove all the horrible stuff and just get to the basis of what if we had a creative commons q a for programmers by programmers and i thought that was a brilliant idea i was like oh my god that's a great idea because i'm not a good idea person i'm really an execution person is really what I am. I'm, I'm good at executing. I'm not good at just blue sky daydreaming. What if we did this? What if we did this? I'm good at iterating and I'm good at execution, but I'm not that kind of dreamer. And Joel had that idea. We loved the idea. We ran with it. And we came up with this Frankenstein's monster or a Venn diagram. You can choose, choose whichever word you like better of stuff that we saw working online. And I still remember this Venn diagram. It's in the blog post that I wrote. It has four circles. One is, these are things that we thought were working on the web. One was Wikipedia. Uh, one was dig slash Reddit, back when dig was still a thing. I forgot about uh, dig. Yeah, I know, exactly. Um, and uh, the other one was uh, blogs. Um, blogs were, were working at, at the time. And anyway, we combined things that we knew were working and said, okay, if we combine the good aspects of all these, these sites and made it into a general purpose, Creative Commons Q&A for programmers, we think that would be a big step forward. That was it. That was the idea. And I loved it. It was a way to also engage with the community, right? Like you, you have this whole audience of people paying attention to the blog and it's like well let's do something let's not just read a blog entry let's read a blog entry and then you know like no underpants and then question mark question mark question mark solve problems right so building this searchable archive of of programming knowledge and it also had downsides too that were hard to see at the beginning because wikipedia is not an institution that that is free from controversy, right? Like, what is notability? 
What does notability mean in the context of Wikipedia, right? Should every man, woman, and child on earth have a Wikipedia page, right? Is, is, does it work like that, you know? So we absorbed a lot of tension from some of these choices, but also a lot of stuff that worked. And that was really it. That was the genesis of the idea. It was me and Joel, and we had a podcast. We would talk every week, very much like this where we talked about, oh, we're going to do this thing. We were kind of coy about what it was because we were still figuring it out, but it was Stack Overflow, and turned that into a podcast. So we had another artifact from the process that we could share with people, and that in itself was also a lesson about working in public versus working in private, you know? Like, ideas don't spring forth from your head like Athena from the head of Zeus, like fully formed, you know? You have an idea, and then... You think, well, gosh, what about this? What about this? And then you have to try things like, well, OK, we build it. And then we found that this really isn't working. So there's a lot of iteration built into the model that was very natural for me because you can't build things without shipping them. You have to ship and build and build and ship. And I don't know if you've ever seen this commercial, but I love this commercial. It's a Super Bowl commercial for, I think, IBM of all companies. It was about building an airplane while you're flying it. like that joke taken to the extreme like they visually showed people like riding on an airplane while while it's being assembled like they're serving drinks and the drinks are flying all in people's faces because of the wind from the airplane it's a great commercial and it's a perfect analogy for building software as you go you know which is risky you know you're in an airplane flying thousands of feet in the air and you're building it like while you're flying it it's it it sounds like a really bad idea but paradoxically it's it's much better than the idea that you can build this perfect thing without actually experimenting and and you know building incrementally as you go so that was it. That was that was the start of everything. Me and Joel having these calls, and then I recruited a few people: uh, Jeff Dalgus, who I'd worked with before at a previous job; Jared Dixon, who I'd worked for worked with at a previous job, and those were the four people that started Stack Overflow. Um, Technically, uh, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but technically Michael Pryor was also a partner just because Joel always split things down the middle with uh, Michael. That's just how they did business. So it was technically Joel, uh, Michael Pryor, me, Jeff Dalgus, and Jared Dixon. And that was it. And then we had these weekly calls, and everybody was kind of on the edge of their seat following the podcast. And then we finally shipped a beta of Stack Overflow, and people got to see what it was. And... And then the journey kind of really began. But that, that was the process. And there wasn't really money involved either. That's the other surprising thing is I thought of Joel as like this sort of rich, successful person. And I was like, okay, so you'll pay for this. And he's like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so we just kind of built it sort of out of pocket. And luckily we were in a privileged place where we had you know savings and money and we were programmers who are making a good living and I could kind of quit my job and pay myself a very small nominal salary. And I think we put in like $10,000 each, uh, me, um, Michael Pryor and Joel, just so that we would have a, a, a LLC, right? Mm -hmm. um, and everybody put in the same amount of money. And I was paying uh, Jeff Dalgus and Jared Dixon just out of pocket, you know, like I want to say like a thousand bucks a month because that's what I could afford. Wow. <laughs> uh, and that, that was it. And we were just like, well, we'll try this and we'll see what happens. But there wasn't like any magical gifting of funds or anything like that. It was just a bunch of programmers fooling around who had the time and money to try something. And we tried that and, you know, kept iterating on it. What year was that? That would have been 2008. Uh, yeah. Right. So it was, uh, <clears throat> it was before cloud, right? More or less. More or less, yeah. Uh, I think it was before cloud. I mean, basically, they had like colos and data center hosting and stuff available. So, uh, but it was a pain back then. So you guys basically did one of those like, you know, '80s or '90s garage startups that people talk about, right? There's uh, initially there's not even any investors. You're just like, you're just cranking it out. What did you guys write it in? 
Uh, it was all uh, ASP.NET. It was um, Microsoft because that's the stack that I was most familiar with, and they had just come out with um, a uh, like a sort of a modern Rails ish ish framework for building web apps that was sort of more aligned with the current at that time state of the art thinking of how to build a web app, which was strongly influenced by Rails, of course. Yeah, and, Rails influenced and uh, everybody's web stacks. You know, with routing and things like that. Yeah. So we had sort of a very reliable set of tools that was actually very, very fast. Uh, people really underrate the the, the, val- the the speed of compiled code <laughs> versus interpreted code. I mean, you can do sort of sleight of hand tricks and stuff, but man, it is staggering. Compiled versus interpreted, like it's it's a big, big difference. It is. Um, it is. And so what's Stack Overflow uh, written in now? I would assume pretty much the same stuff. Now, I left in um, 2011, I want to say. Sure. But uh, you, you think they're still on the Microsoft stack? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they are. SQL Server and everything. And, and the expensive bit is always, of course, SQL Server. That's where they get you with the yep. uh, enterprise licenses and stuff is the databases. It's like the, the lesson of Oracle, the world's most evil person, Larry Ellison. Thank you. That's his gift to the world is very, very expensive databases. And also, didn't they buy uh, MySQL? Yeah, they did, right? They and then did. people had to fork it to MariaDB and all that stuff. When we started Discourse, we actually uh, racked hardware because we were trying to run really lean. And I have to say that even today, uh, the price of cloud stuff has come down substantially. Like, just, if you look at like S3 pricing, just as a pick a pick, pick a metric, right? Um, it is dramatically lower than it was at the start of that era. So the prices have come down, but even factoring for that, um, hardware is so cheap and so fast co-located, um, but it's effort, right? Like you have to buy it, rack it, someone has to install it. I mean, it's not frictionless. And if you need more, you have to go buy more. You can't just push a magic button that gives you more. So I get it, believe me. Like I think hybrid is, is maybe even on the way out. I think cloud is going to become so dominant that like, I think co-located hardware is going to kind of go the way of the Dodo for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, like even today, it's an order of magnitude cheaper, if not more, to yeah. do stuff on bare metal. And it's also incredibly fast. Like the stuff you can buy now, holy crap, like the M2 drives and the uh, the number of cores that AMD pressured Intel into give, giving everyone finally. Thank you, AMD, by the way. Fist bump to AMD for really pushing Intel on this stuff. It's it's incredible, um, the amount I mean, of stuff for, you can For host. what it's worth, Amazon wouldn't have lowered their cloud prices if it weren't for competition from Google and Microsoft. But it was really Google that was driving the prices down because they were just... They were just cutting, 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 cutting on price, right? Because because of economy of scale, right? Google could afford it, so so we all sort of benefited from that. So yeah, we, it's nice to be able to benefit from other people forcing uh, markets to be affordable. It turns out competition actually does matter. It does. <laughs> like it, does. it really, really does. There is no way Intel would have given you. I mean, even stupid stuff like. ECC, error correcting memory, right? And I had to be sort of convinced that this was a thing because I was like, look, I get ECC. I get it. On paper, I get it. But are you going to tell me that every single computing device in the world without ECC is just randomly flipping bits like all over the place? I'm like, how would anything work if that was the case, right? Like, I, I had a hard time just mentally conceptualizing the idea that without ECC, memory simply isn't reliable at all. Um, I have since come around on that. It's more like an insurance policy, particularly as you get to scale. Like, say you run 10 servers, you're not really going to have memory issues. Once you're running 100 servers, you're going to start to have a few memory issues. Exactly. And then uh, 10,000, 100,000, et cetera, et cetera. At scale, it does matter. But individually, well, and, it I doesn't. I mean, look, you, you just hit on the reason that even though Colo hardware is, like, super cheap and super fast, like, if you're successful, you're going to become a victim of your own success because, right, the, the biggest problem is not installing it, right, or, or maintaining it. It's you're going to have hardware failures. Nodes will fail once you get to scale, right, and uh, you're going to have to replace them. And that's, that's, that's the value that these cloud providers give you, basically, is they, they make sure that the hardware layer is constantly being uh, kept up, yeah? 
Yes, but also you got to realize that you have the same pressures on the consumer side. No consumer company wants their stuff to be unreliable because that is expensive, right? If you ship CPUs and 5% of your CPUs are defective, that is pure cost. There is no reason you want to run your business that way. You want 0% defects, right? Because, well, it's a balancing act with the money, right? You have to accept a certain amount of failures, but not so many that you're dealing with like 10,000 return CPUs a day. So there's all this pressure for the consumer stuff to get really, really reliable. You can look at this in something as boring and mundane as power supplies. Power supplies have gotten radically more reliable than they used to be. You can look at like, efficiency was not even thought about. Like go, roll the clock back to, way back to 2004. Nobody was talking about 80 plus gold or, or, or power supply efficiency. No one gave a damn about how efficient, it's, efficient it was to convert, uh, what is it, a DC to AC or AC to DC, anyway. The, the conversion of the power, right? Nobody cared. Uh, but then as things scaled up, right, um, and, and, and heat and other issues came into play, you have 80 plus gold, 80 plus, and they added more. There's 80 plus titanium, there's 80 plus platinum. There's all these <laughs> designations of like, now we actually care about power supply efficiency. And when you, when you fix efficiency, you actually make the power supplies more reliable accidentally along the way so the consumer stuff can be qu quite reliable there's all this pressure for it to be increasingly reliable so the myth of the server hardware so intel wants you to believe that xeon cpus are forged like the ring you know in the fellowship of the ring in a magical forge where enterprisey equipment is made that is better than all the other equipment but the reality is it's the same shit from the same foundries with like <laughs> literally a trace cut so you don't get the uh, enterprise functionality that in this case, let's say ECC, memory correct correcting RAM, Intel's like, nope, if you want ECC, you got to pay for Xeon. You got to pay the Xeon tax for mm. this to work. And it's complete marketing bullshit. It's, that's the only reason. Now, um... AMD fully pushed Intel in this. We're like, nope, we're going to give ECC to everybody. And everybody was, it was like, yes, finally, thank you. That makes so much sense. Like, why, if you could for almost for free, have additional memory integrity, why not? <laughs> Rather than putting it behind the mythical gate of the enterprise hardware. So God bless AMD. God bless competition. Um, yeah. It, it but works. also, I think you've also done a really, really eloquent and effective job of convincing everyone why they shouldn't give a shit about hardware. <laughs> I think the progression of hardware is part of what makes computers fun and interesting is that there's this almost hyperbolic curve of like how much performance we're getting over time. And, you know, there's all this arguments about Moore's law and like, when are we going to hit the limit? And, you know, part of the fun for me was seeing computers go from you're playing Atari 2600 with like incredibly shit graphics. I mean, these graphics hey, are, are good graphics, pathetic, but the box art was beautiful, right? Like I, in fact, on my wall, I have a, a framed uh, portrait of a bunch of Atari box art uh, for their games. Cause I loved the mental energy that went into imagining if games looked like that. And now we have games that actually look as good as the art on the Atari 2600 box, a better even, right? Yeah. That was the dream, man. Like I was in love with that dream. And, and to some extent, I still am in love with that dream and seeing it happen, like seeing, you know, the first, I remember the first video card was basically uh, 3DFX was the first, well, there's some other sort of footnotes if you want to get weird, but 3DFX was the first real good video card for CPU or for PCs and it was an add-on card and I pre-ordered it, I had it waiting and it arrived at my work address and I had to go to work after hours and I forgot the key and I almost like ripped the door off its hinges because I was so desperate to get in and get to my 3DFX card that I had ordered. But luckily, I was. It wasn't fully closed. It's a long story. I didn't actually break into the office. But like, that's how excited I was to get a real. You know, they didn't call them GPUs back then, right? It was just like video card. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> what you could do with a 3DFX card, and it had like I want to say 512 
megabytes of memory total. That, that might be incorrect. Don't quote me on that. But it was just revelatory. I was like, holy shit, like the graphics, the 3D, like we can actually simulate real worlds now. Things look real. I was just head over heels in love with this progression of how fast things were moving. And that's, that's why true. I love the hardware. It's not like, oh, geez, I really want... It. Now, it loses a lot of its flavor when you go from, yay, now I have 16 cores. Yesterday, I had 12. Not quite as exciting as going from, hey, I have one core to dual core. That was actually really significant that first. And, and AMD actually did that. If you go back in time, roll back the clock, AMD were the ones that really popularized dual core. Um, that competitive pressure is what pushed... Uh, Intel into doing multi-core processors mm. and gosh just seeing where things were going like the future is going to look like this box art on these Atari 2600 games I mean who couldn't fall in love with that right but the question is what do we do now now that you've gotten there what do you do I think this is where it gets hard wasn't there a controversy because um, the NVIDIA guy I forget his name the main guy at NVIDIA the the founder guy did a presentation and then after the fact, like weeks later, told people that wasn't actually me. That was actually a GPU rendered version of me. Oh. And that was impressive because nobody called it. It's kind of like, so I have a bet with John Carmack, which John Carmack, surprisingly, one, one of my idols, it's, it was such an honor for him to reach out to me like this. And um and you're also one of my idols, actually, for the record, while we're at it. Um, oh, you're up there with John Carmack in, in, in my book, as far as Well, he's influence. actually done stuff, so uh, he's a better idol than I am. Well, one of your blog posts made a very compelling case that you don't actually have to do stuff to influence people, which I think is <laughs> quite profound <laughs> and also true. So you should maybe rethink that, maybe reread one of your old blog posts and <laughs> talk yourself back into it, because I think you were right when you said that. But it is nice to actually build things, too. Like, if you can build things, build things. Uh, it doesn't take away from anything that you've achieved, though, in my opinion. So John Carmack and I have a bet that by 2030, uh, either his bet is yes, my bet is no. But the, the premise of the bet is there will be fully autonomous, self-driving, level five, there's a special designation for it, self-driving motor vehicles with no human involved in one of the top ten major US cities in 2030. He's saying yes, I'm saying no. It's $10,000 to charity of the winner's choice, 501c3 charity. And I am pretty, I'm, well, I just, I, I'm gonna win. I, I'll, I'll just tell you that straight up because <laughs> that you last 10% is so friggin' hard to get past, you're, right? You're Those gonna little tells. Of, uh, you're gonna win because of regulation. That's, ultimately, that's what happens. It, the regulators are going to move too slowly for it to happen. So John will win in the sense that it will be possible, right? But if your if your bet was actually rolling them out, then then no, um, it, it won't. I don't think it'll happen. But I'm on I'm on your side. Well, you're on his side though. You're on my side for the wrong reason, so I don't allow that. You're actually on John's <laughs> side. So, uh, so uh, I'm pushing you over to his side. You're not allowed to be on my side uh, because yeah. I think philosophically. The point of the bet is that it's not about regulations. It's about is this actually possible in a safe manner, right, without yeah. people getting killed. Now, oh, yeah. we could have an argument about whether the rules are fair or not fair, but, like, I will concede and say that I have lost if in some other city, you know, self-driving cars are just going nuts, like driving around all day long with no problems, right? I will say that basically I lost and, you know, the top 10 was just to sort of, it wasn't about regulation. It was more about like, are they serious about this or not? Let's see. SAE J3016 level five. So that's, it's it's been rules lawyered to, the, to an inch of its life, like already organizationally. So if it can meet that criteria, then John wins in, in, in a major city. And even if it's top 10, like I'll concede if it's not top 10, say it's top 20 city, fine, what if it's, John wins. Does it have to be the US? It does, I think, have to be the US. Because I think it will happen in Singapore by then. Yeah, But they've maybe. been a lot more, they've been, they've been pushing for it. And also their traffic situation is maybe a little bit better because they've got 
they've they've worked really hard to get cars off the road, so it's kind of more feasible there. But anyway, well, I'll be curious to uh, to see how this bet turns out. I'm probably in John's camp, especially since it's eight years out, and people tend to right they people tend to overestimate what you can do in five years and underestimate what you can do in ten years. So. Yeah, we'll see. And and I and I said in my blog post like I'm not you know. I will be cheering if this is achieved. I think it's an amazing thing to strive for. I think a lot of people, even really, really smart people, underestimate that 90-10 rule. Like the last 10% is so, so incredibly, incredibly difficult to get down. So driving on the highway, easy mode, right? Like if if everything was just highways (laughs) and everything was super clearly marked... There were never any weird weather conditions. There were no other erratic human drivers on the road. Sure, yeah, self-driving all day long, baby. Right. But that's not the world that we live in, right? We're talking about the real world full of ambiguity and oddities and once in a million things that shouldn't have happened but did. Well, that's what makes it a fun bet, right? That's why it's it fun. It is a fun and, bet. It's a totally and, fun bet. I'm just, I'm, I'm really, really interested now to see what's going to happen because machine learning is going faster than I Right. We've had fairly significant increases in like single threaded performance. The reason that's important to me is because Discourse is a JavaScript application and JavaScript is basically single threaded performance, right? Can you tell tell us a little bit about it? So Discourse is in many ways it's a sequel to Stack Overflow. So if a you want to think of it Yep, it is. And when I wrote in my blog post, I, I the best analogy I have is Stack Overflow is a scalpel. It's a very sharp, precision instrument designed to do one thing really, really well. And it also assumes a lot of training and initiative of the person who's handling the tool. Okay, So that's the tricky part of Stack Overflow. It's a Q&A system designed for people who are already sort of proficient in the tool to some degree, not totally, because everybody knows different stuff, right? You know, we're all learning from each other. That part is built into the model, but it's not a tool. You don't hand a scalpel to a six-year-old, right? You don't, you don't even hand a scalpel to like an adult without explaining that, hey, by the way, this is super, super sharp, right? So discourse is the table knife to Stack Overflow's scalpel. It's a much, much more general purpose tool. It does more than Q&A. It can be used for subjects that aren't about data, facts, and science, because Stack Overflow, the system, assumes that there is an answer, or four or five good answers to any given question. Now, for a lot of stuff, there's more than five answers. There could be 100 answers. There could be 10,000 answers. You're in a discussion. You're basically dealing with matters of opinion, right? You have to have a topic where there's a rule book or a definitive set of answers or a way to judge, okay, this answer is mostly correct, this answer is mostly incorrect. That's the system that Stack Overflow is. Discourse loosens all those constraints. The closest analogy to it is a forum. Oh, and that was the missing, how ironic. That was the missing Zen, uh, excuse me, uh, Venn diagram puzzle piece was forums. Forums. <laughs> was the one piece. It was forums, blogs, Wikipedia, yeah, and dig Reddit. That's it. Those are the four pieces. I just now remembered it. How okay. ironic that I would forget forums. Forums was an inspiration for Stack Overflow. Nice. So we took that piece and really ran with it and said, hey, look, it doesn't have to be Q&A. It doesn't have to be a topic that is about data, facts, and science. There could be hundreds of right answers. There could be no right answer. You could be, just be hanging out here having fun. You're not supposed to go to Stack Overflow and just like hang out and crack jokes. You're supposed to like get shit done. It's like a place for people to do work. It's a school environment, right? It's a place of learning. Okay. It is it is like a community college, okay? Okay. Whereas discourse is more like, hey, I'm going to open a bar. I'm going to open a restaurant. I'm just going to open a place for a clubhouse for people to hang out, do whatever we want to do, chill out, hopefully not get hurt in the process, hopefully not hurt anyone else in the process. There is tooling built into discourse to help you moderate those spaces and make sure that nothing weird happens. Like, you know, like 4chan and some other, there's a lot of just really unmoderated spaces and we went all in on really hardcore, really deep moderation tools that help whoever's in charge set whatever rules they wanna set. 
I see. So that's that's kind of how those two things are connected. And Discourse is also fully open source. Um, now, if I open source Stack Overflow, and Joel always hated this idea. In fact, there was one podcast that was so funny. He hated that concept so much that he literally started talking about the weather just to make a point. <laughs> He's like, how about that weather? And I was like, what? What's it? And it was like he hated it. But in the end, he was right because Stack Overflow is such a specialized tool that you really need almost training to use it properly, just like you would need training to use a scalpel, you know? Mm -hmm. So all the open source clones of Stack Overflow more or less failed. Like you don't really see, I mean, do you see any other giant Q&A sites running on open source software? It's Stack Exchange is like an offshoot of Stack Overflow? Stack Exchange is Stack Overflow, okay. just with different topics. So right. it's the same right. engine used for different topics. Yeah, but I, I don't think that it has necessarily anything to do with open sourcing, right? I, I think that, that what happened was you guys built a network accidentally or intentionally, but right, you know how you know how buyers go where sellers are, or sellers go where buyers are? Well, seekers of knowledge go where the answers are, and the answerers go where the seekers are, and you guys created a network effect with Stack Overflow, and that means nobody can beat it because it's a network. Well, the reason the information is so good, though, is because the rule set was so strict. Because they said, "Look, this is a place yeah, I mean, of learning." You look, I mean, you also you also did fantastic with the moderation and with encouraging you know, the whole uh, incentivization or the, the karma or whatever it is that you get there and all that, right? I mean, you well, you can look at. I don't want to kick them when they're down because clearly they're down now. But Quora back in the day, oh my God, well, venture capitalists insisted that Quora because it was you know ex Facebook people. It was obviously the future of the internet. And I, I kept telling people, like, no, no, Quora has no idea what they're doing because they're allowing questions on Quora. Like, this is literally a question on Quora. What did Jesus's farts smell like? Right, 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 right. And I'm like, dude, the minute you allow stuff like that on your platform, you don't know what you're doing. Because, first of all, that can't be answered. Second of all, that doesn't matter. That doesn't solve any problem for anyone in the entire world. No one is blocked by not knowing what Jesus' fart smelled like. But you see where this is going. They didn't know what they were building, whereas we kind of did know what we were building. Now, we got some stuff wrong, to be fair, but we adjusted quickly and realized, like, okay, we're building a scalpel. It's a sharp instrument. We need a lot of sort of training and help and discipline around getting this thing to work. And in the end, hey, you have a surgeon that can use the scalpel to save your life. That's pretty sweet, right? Yeah. Well, that didn't just magically happen. There was a lot of training and a lot of like processes we had to invent to get the surgeon and the tool together, right? So, yeah. That's So for discourse like, I mean like when you mentioned when you described discourse, of course the first thing that popped to mind was Quora which despite languishing and not being the site that, it, that everybody thought it would be, it still actually is the only place with answers to a lot of interesting questions with any answers at all. Uh, and then you, and then we have this whole collection of really, really crummy, like nineties era forum BBS software. I mean, like I, forums are still alive and well, if I want to like talk about my preamp hardware with a group of people online, I'm going to go to a forum, right? So our, is discourse basically saying all that software is garbage because it is, and we're doing it. We're doing a better job of it. So move your forums over to discourse. Is that is that an oversimplification? That's that's a correct summary of what we're trying to do with discourse. I would say that we have pivoted a little bit to the utility part. Uh, the entertainment part is important because if you're going to go to a party, it has to be fun, right? You, fun is a requirement for people to hang out together, you know, in, in any space, online, offline. It's got to be entertaining to some degree, right? I mean, if you're in a school, you're trying to get a degree, right? You're on Stack Overflow because you have a job. You're going to get fired if you don't figure out this problem or it's going to ding you on your performance review or your OKR, whatever they're calling them these days, well, right? Yeah, I get it. I mean, like, no, of course you want it to be entertaining, but I mean, like, okay, and I never thought I would find myself uttering this particular sentence, but on Discourse, can I ask what Jesus' fart smelled like? Oh, absolutely. You could. Oh. You're going to get a weird response depending on which Discourse you ask it on. But yeah, that's, that's totally, totally allowed because... Each one has its own rule set. You know, it's an open source engine. Let a million flowers bloom, right? But Quora, a million... Quora doesn't have that sort of uh, sub forum or subreddit like Notion then? It's just a big open free-for-all? 
as far as I can tell, I don't spend a ton of time on Quora. I do end up there occasionally when I'm just searching for people just like, I don't know. Yeah, I never Quora. seek it out. I always find it through search results where somebody asked, right? Yeah, it's some question that nobody should have asked in the first place. Like, you know, how much Oxycontin can I take without dying right. while also injecting heroin? Like, just just really bad, bad ideas that also happen on Reddit. So I'm not singling out Quora here. Okay. Reddit is a fount of just crazy information. It's sort of a mixture of a hair-raising mixture of sort of inspiring content, useful content, and just like content from the depths of hell that yeah. should have never been on the internet in any form. So it's just hard to reconcile how all over the map this stuff is. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, it is the internet. You want diversity. You, you want like thousands of different communities. I don't want just one Facebook, one Instagram, one Discord. I want thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of sites that I can go to where I can have whatever kind of experience I want to have. You want diversity on the internet, literal diversity. Mm. And Discourse is about providing that kind of diversity with a modern tool set. It provides two-factor authentication built in, all the modern amenities you would expect from a platform like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. But it's yours. It belongs to you. It's open source. You can help us build it. You could join the Discourse team if you, if you get really excited about it. Um, and you can shape it. You could run the Q&A plugin and you could have a mini clone of Stack Overflow. I wouldn't recommend it because I don't think it'll do well, but you could do that. Or you could have just a, a subsection of your site where it's like, okay, this is the Q&A section where we ask Q&A like programming problems, right? You could turn right. on the Q&A plugin there. So it's a little CMS-y in that WordPress was kind of like uh, our inspiration to some degree, okay. except not for blogging, but for forums. What is the end state of a really good open source forum platform that is written in JavaScript and Ruby on the back end, mm -hmm. uh, you know, totally free, totally open source, uh, really high level of engineering quality. I mean, tooting our own horn here, but we, you know, try to have all the best security practices old forum software is notorious for just being just a fount of like massive security holes right so yeah. just to have a good option to build a community space that belongs to you and in fact i remember pitching to you for your game i was like hey steve why don't you run a discourse around your game and then people who are interested in it could hop in you could talk to them right. you could talk to yourself there it's a there's a wiki feature you could turn a topic into a wiki you could have all kinds of wiki information in a category there. You could have a feedback section. You could have a gameplay section. You could just hang out with other people that love the thing that you love. Yeah, and I, I, I um, and at the time, here's the problem: is is um, right. We have a we have a, a we have a wiki and we have a subreddit. And we, have, you know, you know what I mean. And there's a Discord, and yeah, they're all disjoint, and they're not connected to each other, and they all have different administrators, and so it's a mess. But it was getting us by, so we never did get around to, to checking it out. But it definitely seems like I mean, I was certainly looking for something like that five years ago when I was trying to set all this up, or pro it's probably closer to ten years now at this point. You uttered sort of the key, the key phrase here, which is time. It's like, well, if you have systems that are kind of working for you, and you know, this is a labor of love. It's not like you're getting paid to write your game. So I appreciate that we have a limited amount of time. The systems you have in place were mostly working. You're not going to just throw everything away. It's like, well, Jeff said I should do this, so I got to do all this extra work now rather than working on my game. So I, I totally get it. You know, like there's a lot of tools, and again, this goes back to diversity. I'm not saying, hey, discourse should be the only method of interacting on the internet. I'm saying the opposite of that. I'm saying we should have lots of methods of interacting on the internet, but they should be open source, right? Mm -hmm. And we should hold them to fairly high standards in terms of supporting open source, supporting an open internet, not letting everything belong to Discord, belong to Facebook slash Meta, uh, you know, belong to Google, right? They should belong to us. And that is a barrier because it's effort, right? It's a lot easier to just push the button that says, hey, create a Discord, boom, done, Discord. Now I have a community, problem right. solved, move right. on to my next problem. Right. Um, I get it, you know, it, it, it totally makes sense. And that's really our biggest uh, enemy is just friction. It's just how can we make it 
easier to get started, uh, remove all the barriers. I can't unfortunately, you know, give you a free server to run the free software on. No. But what I can do is make the setup as painless and simple and easy as possible. I can have a wizard that guides you through the setup, gives you, you know, some nice ways to make it look pretty, um, lets you set it up the way you like so it, you know, meets your needs, looks at, you know, say you need the Q&A plugin and installs the Q&A plugin because you're going to have a Q&A section. That's the best we can really do. Have you thought um, about like offering an ingestion facility so that, or, or, or an import so that people can migrate their, their old history over? Yeah, we have entire frameworks of migration, but migrations are, they're still special snowflakes. Every migration is unique, unfortunately. There's just so much forum software out there and all on different versions that it's still quite a bit of friction to get things pulled in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th there's a certain amount of work involved here that, that is kind of inevitable and unavoidable, no matter how easy you try to make it. This is why decentralized anything is super friggin' hard, right? Mm -hmm. Centralization is easy, yeah. real easy. And decentralized, oh my God, it is unbelievably difficult it is so. it is well hey man thanks for telling us about discourse and i'm definitely going to go check it out again i think that just like database migrations everybody kind of knows they need to get off their current database almost everybody does right but actually you know doing it it requires the pain to, to reach a certain threshold people just roll in gradually right as they find that their form software is starting to collapse or, or not not meet modern needs and I don't know. I you know. I hope so. Is it is it doing well? Is Discourse doing okay? Is it meeting your uh, your expectations? Yeah. I mean, I think Discourse is. Uh, you know, you you could always do better, but I mean, we're seeing we're hiring, we're growing. You know, the the graphs are going up and to the right, like you want them to. That's I awesome. mean, you could argue. Well, you know, you should have been Instagram. It's like, well, sorry, I wasn't in the right place <laughs> at the right time when people realized that cameras were all going to be the only kind of camera you would ever carry would be the one on your cell phone yeah. instagram just kind of got there first and had the right right place right time right but you know I'm, I'm super happy with what we created i think it has a very very high level of uh expertise attached to it both in terms of how it approaches community the software itself it's a really sophisticated piece of software that you can kind of be proud of huh. if you want it, like say you adopt it into your family, if you will. You would be proud to have discourses, at least I, I think you would be proud to have discourses as part of your family. Now, whether you want a family that big, I don't know, right? Or maybe it doesn't meet your needs, right? You so know, like if I went too. over there and I was like, I want to make Stevie's Clubhouse, and it's just a place where people can come and hang out with Steve. Like, is discourse a place I could do that? Uh, it is. And in fact, we're adding uh, chat functionality as we speak. In fact, we're beta testing it ourselves. That was one of the big missing pieces. We's, we always had to have, there's two types of communication, fast lane and slow lane. Now, fast lane is like it's about presence. It's like, I need to know if Joe is here because, you know, we're having this problem with a customer and I need to know right now how to fix it. And then slow lane is, gosh, the reason we had this problem with this customer is this text is really confusing that describes this feature, or there's no text that describes the feature. <laughs> That's a slow lane conversation, right? So you have to have both of these kinds of conversations. And finally, we acquiesced, and rather than just integrating with chat, we're actually implementing chat. Mm. So you can smoothly move from slow lane to fast lane and back and forth. Or if you've seen the Pixar movie Inside Out, every memory rolls along as a little ball of memory and you got to decide is this a short-term memory that i basically throw away or is it a long-term memory that goes into my long-term storage and i remember this for later so that we decide oh yeah it was really hard to change that text what if we made it easier to change the text whenever we have problems like this that would ultimately give us a better product because we can move more rapidly right that's a longer term discussion you can have both of those on the same platform now and that was a big oversight on my part. I resisted that for a long time, and that's on me. But I now acknowledge that chat is kind of dominating the internet, for better yeah, or worse. Yeah. You can see this with Discord, but it really struggles with memory because people come in and ask the same question over and over and over and over and over, right? Because right, right. there's no long-term memory. Right. So with Discourse, we're really trying to merge those two worlds in right. open source in a place that you own. Mm. Discord owns Discord. You right. don't own that space. Right. So whether that matters to you or not, I don't know. I can't say, 
But I will say that it's healthier for the internet when you actually own the spaces that you gather in. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will definitely check it out. I'm, I'm very intrigued because I, as I told you before we started recording, I've, I have been looking for a place where I can sort of set up a, a place where I can just uh, chat with people like, um, you know, more directly. I mean, there weren't any really good options. So, um, so I'll check it out. So, hey, Jeff, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. I would love to have you back again sometime to talk about more stuff since we could obviously talk like all day. Sure, you can try You can try Discourse, then the next show will be like all about how Discourse sucks and is terrible, and I tried it, and it was just a horrible disaster. Yeah, you know, or, <laughs> or you know, more likely, I'll like it and then, you know, ask for a couple of things, right? <laughs> all that being said, it would be lovely. Anyone listening to this, if you just even just look at Discourse and provide feedback, like, I love that kind of feedback because, you know, ultimately the point of software is to be used, right? Like you don't want to build a house nobody lives in. So mm -hmm. for people who are living in our house that we built together, I will always prioritize your feedback because I'm in there with you, buddy. We're, mm -hmm. we're living in the same house. I'm just trying to build a place to live in that doesn't make me lose my damn mind <laughs> and hopefully also lets you retain your sanity, right? While also building sort of knowledge for the internet, right? Like that we can build on. Yeah. Standing on the shoulders of giants, man. We gotta do both of those things. It does sound pretty cool. I think I'm starting to get it. But yeah, next time we will talk about it because I'll have direct experience. So hey, Jeff, man, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. And it, it's great to, I don't think we've ever really spoken before. So it's nice to actually meet you as well. And I was on your podcast to... once, but you weren't there. So mostly it was me and Joel talking because of the proximity effect. But, uh, but yeah. Oh, wow. Good times. <sighs> All right, man. Well, hey, yeah. And we will see you next time. Uh, uh, and folks, hey, uh, I hope you enjoyed having uh, Jeff Atwood, the famous Jeff Atwood on our show. Uh, if you like this content, please subscribe to the channel. It actually matters because YouTube won't surface me unless I get enough subscribers. So it actually matters and comment and like it and, and all that stuff that people beg for. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a real, real, uh, real honor and a privilege to have Jeff on the show today. And uh, we will see you next week for Stevie's Tech Talk. Bye, everybody.